Uh, yeah, I did it. Hi there, we're here at Meet and Greet in Chicago, and uh, excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Kugner, who's a neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins. Uh, great to be here with you. Um, I've been in several marriages with these disorders. Syngap, Syngap mutation and, and variants. Um, but I've worked on NMDA receptors and, and AMP receptor specifically in um, the GRIN genes for the last 40 years. Um, and so, um, as a basic scientist, and so I uh, know a lot about them, and we are now starting to look at the variants, in, especially in the But um, what I thought I'd give you a little primer about how the brain works, and um, start very basic, and and then talk about the syngap story. The syngap is very similar. To, uh, you know, it's a rare variant. Called Syngap. Syngap actually physically interacts in the synapse with uh, NMDA receptors and, and with, um, with the AMP receptors, the GRI and the GRIN gene. Um, and so um, the, the kids are, you know, having similar issues, similar, uh, you know. Can you hear me in the back? Yay! Yes. So um, I'll come back to to. To them, um, and this is just a, you can't see the two great here. This, this image. So this is actually a, um, a neuron in the dish. So we're growing. This is a, a rat neuron that we have grown in the, in, the, in the dish, and you can see all those little speckles or synapses. But um, first, I want to talk about. Um, So, first, I am working on this actively with the drum. So, I mean, that's an explosion, but that should make you happy. Um, <clears throat> so, we're working um, both on syngap, which I'll talk mostly about today, but also working with the developing compounds for uh, these other rare disorders, including grin uh, uh, rare variants and uh, amber, the Bria rare variants. Okay, so <clears throat> this is not a fish brain. This is a human, or it's a, a, a image of a, a sort of a cartoon of a human brain. And what is uh, really remarkable about the brain is that it's, um, there are a billion neurons, there are a billion different cells in the human brain, a hundred billion. So that's a, a you know ridiculous number to think about. But there, right now in your brain. There are a billion of these cells, 100 billion of cells, uh, talking to each other. That's how the brain works. Um, so the brain, um, and I have a little video here. The delay. It's changed on my computer. Okay, so this is going to be a little video of what happens in the brain. So it's an animation. So all those spindly things are neurons. Um, you can see, um, you know, all, this, these are each a neuron. And then the, all these processes that are coming out are sort of the connections that are uh, connecting the other brain neurons. And so um, we have a little video of what the electrical signals that are occurring between these uh, neurons. So the brain is working through electricity, and that's why uh, when it's overactive, you get seizures. And so this um, one neuron is firing away electrical signal to another, and then it actually contacts, each of these neurons contact about other, about 10,000 other neurons. So they're talking to each other all the time. And they talk to each other at these points of contact uh, called synapses right here. And so if each of these uh, 100 billion neurons contact 10,000 uh, other neurons, you have 
trillions, if not quadrillions, of synapses. So right now in your brain, your, your, uh, your synapses are firing away and talking to each other. And so um, this is basically how the, the brain works. It forms these circuits, sort of like um, you know, electrical circuits, that are very specific between different areas of the brain. <clears throat> and that's what underlies your behavior. Like what controls your behavior are these very specific circuits that make me move my hand or uh, make me actually have emotions or or um, you know, uh, remember something. Um, so, so that's what's occurring in the brain all the time. So you have all this uh, communication between the neurons, um, but you know, it's not a static process. I mean, you know, this is not a um, uh, you know, hardwire. You're learning, right? So you're learning things. You know, you're hoping that you're learning something today, maybe something a little bit, and um, um, and you're going to remember that you know for day, a week, um, or maybe not, or maybe 10 years, you know, so, so how is the brain changing when you learn something? And so what um, a major uh, way that uh, um, scientists have been studying for a long time is a process called uh, synaptic plasticity. So the, the, that the strength of these synaptic connections changes um, with experience. So here um, we've um, I just blown up two neurons, and here's the point of contact between these two neurons. And so um, remember, there are 10,000 of these contacts. But if you zoom in on this uh, little region, this is called the synapse. Um, this is where the communication occurs. So one neuron ends here, and one neuron, the second neuron. Here. And it's the communication between these neurons that make you, these circuits that, that control the flow of electricity through your brain. Now, what uh, happens is that um, the neurons communicate by releasing neurotransmitters, and um, so this is just uh, again animation showing the release of neurotransmitter, and in this case, it's glutamine. That, this is what uh, the neurotransmitter is. It's glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So it's the major neurotransmitter that regulates the excitability of the neurons. Now, um, the, and the, then the receptors um, that um, we're going to be talking about are here. So these receptors receive the signal, they bind glutamate, and then they uh, generate an electric current in the second cell. So that's how that, that communication between uh, two neurons occurs. The release of glutamate and then binding to the receptors, and then that activates this, this cell. So th again, this process is occurring billions of times a second right now, where you're thinking, believe it, you know, it's amazing to think about. And um, but it's not static. So it's got change. You're going to learn something. Um, it's got to change. And so Back in the 1970s, there was um, something called uh, Discovery, which was the, the dynamic regulation of the synaptic communication. So uh, people, scientists found that synapses between two neurons can be modified and can be changed with experience. And that's uh, illustrated in this one uh, here. And uh, this is um, a schematic of an old experiment that's um, very, very famous in the field. And this is what has taken a, a, a brain section from a, a rat, and you stick an electrode in one area of the brain, and then you record the signal in the, in the second uh, area of the brain. So you stimulate, and then you see how, uh, how strong the connection is between one area and the next area. And so, um, so here, this is an illustrative. Um, here's the stimulating electrode, this is the recording electrode. And so this is measuring the strength of synaptic transmission between uh, these two areas. So this, uh, the, this height here is the, the strength, and then this is time. And if you simulate and record uh, for several minutes, this is very stable. It doesn't change. But if you, if you manipulate um, the simulation, 
like an experience. If you have a lot of sensory stimulation coming in, uh, you can get uh, strengthening of the synapse. And, and this is called um, down here. You can see very quickly the synaptic strength doubles. So you're increasing the synaptic strength, and this is called synaptic plasticity. You'll probably, if you haven't heard about it, you're going to hear about it um, as, as you learn more and more about it. So this is uh, famously called long-term potentiation, or LPP. It's one of the founding um, mechanisms of the brain that underlies, uh, many of us think underlies how we learn and how we you know, basically code memories. Now, uh, also at the same time, or a little bit later, um, it was discovered that there's something called long-term depression. So in this case, you can get that stable baseline again, the synapses, uh, the connectivity is, is very stable. But then if you do a different manipulation, you actually do a very low level stimulation, uh, you actually get a, uh, mm -hmm. the, the synapses become weaker. And, um, and this is illustrated here. So here you have two basic mechanisms. One mechanism to make the synapses stronger, one to make them weaker. And combining these things is a way to sculpt the circuits in the brain, so you can make synapses between different neurons uh, weak and other ones stronger. And that new um, that new circuit you can imagine could be a memory. So um, so this new this new circuit are, that are scoped by experience actually physically encode them. So a question we and many others of the field have. Uh, asked is, so you're strengthening synapses. How do you do that? How do you make a synapse stronger? Do you release more glutamate? Or do you have more receptors, to make the receptors work better or work less? And so, um, so we and many others have been studying this for years. And again, the receptors we're talking about are glutamate receptors that are found here. And so what we've studied over the years is how these receptors are um, regulated. How, the, how do you make them work better? How do you make them work, make, uh, work uh, less well? And so that's the process of plasticity. And um, what we've discovered is that the receptors work with a lot of other genes. So um, in the synapse, there are um, about 700 different gene products, proteins. So, so there are 700 of these proteins that are directly binding to each other, physically interacting, and helping the receptors work, or making the receptors work less well. And um, this is what controls the receptors, the, the efficiency of the receptor, and uh, control the strength of the synapse. So, um, so it turns out that um, these uh, proteins, so here are the receptors, these not quite as fancy as, as uh, Lonnie, uh, but, um, but uh, these are the receptors. And um, and each of these is um, a, a, another protein. So it turns out many of these, these genes is, are, um, are sites of variants that cause intellectual disability, uh, autism, and schizophrenia. So, so this is really a hub, this is a, a focus of a lot of research <laughs> in these rare uh, nice. disorders. So, um, so it turns out that these um, these genes actually regulate the number of receptors at the synapse. So remember, during plasticity, you're regulating the strength of the, the, the synaptic connection. And um, what um, many people over the last uh, 20 years or so have found is that um, during LTP, that, that um, paradigm for regulation of, of the strength of synapses, you actually add more receptors. So in this case, uh, more uh, antler receptors. And so that increases the strength of the synapse mm -hmm. and um, is involved in learning memory, which uh, many, many labs have um, illustrated that. Now, the opposite occurs with LTV. Remember, I talked about depression, and in that case, you, um, what happens during LTV is actually you physically take the, the receptors away. 
So by this bi-directional regulation is really the fundamental way synapses are regulated and learning of memory um, is encoded in the brain. So, so I want to tell the story about SIMGAP today because it's very relevant to uh, Grin and uh, Ridge um, variants. Um, and so SIMGAP is a, a gene we discovered in, over 20 years ago, back in 1998 now, as being a gene that's, uh, that binds to the same complex, of, this complex of proteins uh, that include the receptors, but also, um, for example, NMDA receptors and AMP receptors. And um, we found that it's very important, as I'll show you, in learning and memory in, in mice. So we started this um, year, again, 20 years ago. Um, this is a picture of, of uh, Syngap in a neuron. So the, this, uh, this is a neuron in a dish. And all those little yellow dots are Syngap found at synapses. So you can see this, this neuron has about um, you know, thousands of synapses. In, in, uh, in pinching on it. Now, on the bottom is the structure of Syngap. I'm not going to go into that in detail. But what we did is, um, you know, uh, similar to what uh, was discussed with the, the uh, zebrafish, is that uh, we could we could use genetic methods to knock out the gene, to delete the gene, and see what how that would impact, in this case, a mouse. So we deleted the gene in a mouse. And so we made a, uh, a little mouse. It's coming. So we, we used these uh, techniques back in the business, but again, 20 years ago. Uh, we deleted the gene. And it turns out if you delete both copies of the gene, remember the two alleles, one from the father, one from the mother, and um, and if we deleted both copies of the gene, actually the baby mice would, would die within a, a baby, three or four days. But we found that much to our surprise, if you delete just one copy, then the mice were born, they were fine, they appeared to be fine. But then when we started looking at them, they had a lot of de uh, de deficits. So one of the deficits they had um, immediately was that LTP was not uh, working as well as their um, wild type or, or um, uh, litter mates. So their litter mates that had a, you know, two copies of the gene had a, a larger LTP, larger plasticity than the, uh, the heterozygote, the, um, the mice that only had one copy. So this indicates um, that if you have 50% of that gene, um, your plasticity is going to be less. And that would predict that maybe they would learn uh, poorly. And that's what uh, occurs. So these mice have been studied by many, many labs. And um, one way we study their, their uh, behavior is shown here. This is called a Y maze. And you put a mouse in it. Very simple behavior. And the mice are very curious. So they, they will uh, go around and go down all the arms of this, of this maze, and they'll remember where they were, and they'll always go to the new arm. They, they won't go back to the same arm they just came from. And so you can measure that by looking at how many times they alternate. They come to that middle choice point, and then they decide to go one way or another. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the wild type uh, mice that have both copies of, of the gene they alternate about, about 70%. So they, they alternate to the new novel arm about 70% of the time, where the mutant, um, the heterozygotes, um, basically get to that, that choice point and just randomly go to one way or another. So they, they're not remembering where they've been. So this is an easy assay that we've done. And there are many, many other behavioral assays you can look at, um, spatial learning and, and um, variety of other paradigms that we study. We need to study social interactions as well. And um, so um, um, this is just a, 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 a phenotype that we now use, for example, for screening drugs or, or um, potential therapies. 
So this is all well and good. We were trying to figure out how um, normal brain function occurs in mice at least. And we have a lot of data that soon gap is really important. And finally, in uh, two, year 2009, the Jack Michaud's laboratory in Montreal uh, discovered three children with variants, uh, very severe mutations in, in Syngap. So these are uh, patients, the first three patients identified. And these were um, had one copy, mm -hmm. one normal copy of Syngap, and one allele that had a really severe mutation, either a frame shift or um, we can talk about different mutations uh, in a few minutes. So we've gotten involved with um, the Syngap uh, Family Foundations, and um, it's now clear that Syngap is, is um, there are lots of new kids. So there are, uh, now I think there's up to 1,300 kids that have been identified across the world, and um, it's estimated there's tens of thousands of these kids. They're all over, all over you know, you know, China, Japan, South America, Europe, everywhere. So all these kids have um, intellectual disability. They have uh, autistic repetitive features. They have some uh, features that are similar to autistic autism. Um, they have sleep problems. Um, they have uh, seizures. And um, they have intestinal issues and, and I mean, very similar issues that many of your children uh, might have. So um, we've gotten involved with a um, company and we've been, uh, with, with um, first of all, the family foundations. Um, but um, so initially with the uh, Syngap One Foundation um, and then recently, more recently with the Syngap Research Foundation. I really have met a lot of the kids and um, been working with these two groups to um, to help educate families and also uh, to um, you know advocate for uh, support for for you know genetic analysis. Um, as, as some of you may know, I mean, I, you know a lot of uh, parents have children who are intellectually disabled for 34 years and they don't know why. And then all of a sudden, because of these genetic approaches, you you, you get um, you know, your exome sequence um, and um, you discover, oh, my kid has a single amputation. You know, they're 50, 50 years old now, but, um, and so um, then they have come join these community groups and family groups and really found sort of their tribe, you know, to, to share, um, you know, all of the issues that and, um, and of course, each each variant in each gene uh, has, uh, you know, they're pretty similar, but there are also some, you know very specific uh, phenotypes for each each of these different um, genes. So what we did is we started a clinic in um, at Johns Hopkins University uh, for Syngap kids, and they come in. Uh, this is the Monaco well. Uh, son Beckett, and so he would, I think he was the sixth I diagnosed with Syngap kid, and he has a um, severe uh, mutation. And so he comes over and he goes to the clinic and gets worked up, he gets an EEG, and then he comes over to the lab and uh, you know, works with this is part of my Syngap team here. And um, um, uh, we, we've uh, been interacting with that for a long time. And so what we decided to do is to start um, making mouse models, very similar to the zebrafish model idea, is to actually engineer variants um, from the kids into the into mice. So, so far we've made three different uh, variants, and we're trying different um, we're trying different um, mutations. So the first one we did is patient number three. So we, um, she has a severe frame shift and truncation. So uh, our guess would be that she would have only one functional gene. So she would have 50% of Syngap, just like our heterozygote um, deletion knockouts in mice. And so we actually engineer exactly her mutation into a mouse gene because the, the sequences are pretty similar. 
And um, so when we analyzed the mice, we got the mouse, and it turns out we can measure the level of protein. This uh, the method to do that's called Western block. And you can see that um, this mutant mouse has exactly 50% uh, of syngap. And so we would predict that um, patient number three has 50% of syngap, just like the, the, the deletion um, mice that we made you know, 20 years ago. So, um, so we've gone on to look at other uh, phenotypes. As I told you, we can look at LTP. So here we're looking at plasticity. This variant also has a deficient uh, LTP. It's about 50% uh, LTP under these conditions. It also has the same uh, behavioral um, phenotype. As shown here, so here's that the same uh, Y. Oops. The same. Um, Y maze, uh, looking at the working memory, so here's the litter mate that has two normal genes. Here's the um, mutant that has a um, variant that has 50% uh, of the one allele. So it's very similar to what we saw with the, with the knockout. But we've also gone on to um, work with um, somebody we know, and that is T Tony. Uh, so Mike is the, the um, CEO of the Syngap Research Foundation, and so um, his son Tony has a very interesting mutation. It's a so this is not an intron mutation; it's an, um, an exon mutation. So it's not in the coding region of the gene, but it's actually involved in the intron. And so this is it's a quite different type of, of gene and um, mutation. And so we made exactly the same. Um, Tony's mutation in, in a mouse. And again, what we got is that this mouse has 50% of same gap, exactly. And we, that would suggest that Tony has 50% of same gap in, in his brain. So um, we this is actually coming out um, in post soon. Um, and we went on to do the, the physiology as well. Physiology of this mouse, again, you have this def deficit in, in the plasticity and the deficit in behavior as well. And um, we're now doing EEGs on, on these mice, and they, they all have the characteristic uh, seizures, very similar to the, have the seizures that the kids have. So, um, you know, this is, you know, um, these are mouse models are really useful. They're going to be very useful when we're trying to uh, rescue the expression of, of these uh, of syngap in these mice by a variety of methods. I'm going to mention a couple of them. But, um, but you can't do 96 well plates with these guys. And so we need to develop um, a good strategy and then try to rescue them. And, um, and then we can, um, for example, doing this now, um, try to see whether our therapies will improve, improve behaviors or the, the seizures, um, and, um, and then take that, you know, eventually, hopefully, into the clinic. So, um, so summary is that SYNCAP is this, this gene that we discovered 20 years ago. It regulates the, recept the, the receptors, the GRIA receptors, uh, the AMP receptors. Now, NMDA receptors and, and uh, AMP, uh, NMDA re and AMP receptors uh, interact a lot. I mean, you know, NMDA receptors regulate AMP receptors and then vice versa. So that's why some of the, the um, you know, kids who have variants in NMDA and AMP receptors can have very similar phenotypes. You know, they can have seizures. Um, or they can have uh, intellectual disability, or they can have you know, many common, um, similar things. And then, um, so we, you know, we studied this in mice for years, and this is sort of a, a basic science dream. You know, you're trying to figure out how the brain works, and then all of a sudden, you're 
trying to help, you know, therapy, develop ther therapies for the kids. And um, so, um, so we are working, and there are many uh, companies now, um, especially small biotech companies that are really interested in SYNGAP, but they're becoming very interested in, in RINs, you know, RINs and Nucleus as well. So, um, so a list of, kind of let's show you some of the approaches we we and others are trying to take. And this may not uh, mean a lot to you, but so there's lots of genetic approaches we're taking. So these are sort of you know science fiction uh, approaches that are actually starting to work. So they're actually working in Drafe. And uh, other um, uh, rare disorders, and um, and there's a lot of um, enthusiasm, really excitement that they're going to work in, in love and these other rare disorders. So we know the gene. Um, we can try to figure out what you know whether it's a gain function or loss of function, and um, and then try to address that um, by either uh, by a variety of approaches. So certainly small molecules are going to be one way to regulate um, these genes, especially receptors, because receptors are easy to target. They're easy to develop drugs to. And so there's a lot of companies that are trying to work, uh, develop G, uh, small molecules that will increase the function of NMDA receptors, and some that are uh, trying to regulate the, the uh, decrease the, the uh, function of the NMDA receptors. And so you could use that to either, depending on your on the variant, whether it's a gain of function or a loss of function, you could use these drugs to try to counteract that, that, that issue. Um, but there's genetic approaches. So one, one of the most simple-minded ways to do it is just to replace the defective gene with a, a normal gene. So um, you may have heard of this, uh, you know, the, a viral approach. So you take a virus called AAV, and you put the normal gene in there, and then you try to um, express that in the brain. And so um, lots of people are doing that uh, to try to rescue, for example, especially these genes where you have what's called haploid insufficiency, where you only have one good copy. So if you could, um, you know, um, the other gene's not there at all, so you just put in enough, uh, enough of a normal copy to get it up to you know, twice as much as the, um, as the the, um, the variant that's knocking down one allele. So that's AAV delivery. That's that's going to be. It's not quite there yet. There's um, there are some get um, possibilities that may um, uh, accelerate the development of AAVs. But then there are, are small antisense oligos, ASOs. Um, you might have heard about this, but it's. Um, It's <coughs> uh, antisensologos have been very successful in, for example, in, in spinal mu muscular atrophy, and that's kind of revolutionized. That's one reason um, there's so much interest in, in treating these rare disorders is because they success in treating uh, spinal mus muscular atrophy. And, um, and then there's a variety of other uh, sort of uh, high-tech science fiction approaches that don't seem to be so crazy these days. They're becoming, um, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, potential interest. Um, and a lot of the companies that I'm working with are developing these, um, these type of approaches. So these, all these approaches that we use in SYNGAP can be used for these other rare disorders. I don't know what your variants are, but they're um, you know, uh, nonsense mutations, nonsense mutations. But um, there are different approaches to address the different variants. So, um, so you know, we, we've been funded by an NIH, um, three, both aging, um, mental health, and uh, neurological disorders, and also the Syngap Research Fund is funded. Also, uh, the Simon Foundation, Safari, is, is funded as, as well. So these are uh, the current people in my laboratory over here, and the people in yellow are people working on SYNGAP. Mm -hmm. um, um, we are now starting to work on uh, 
three of variants. Um, so we have, if we've made a mouse that has a uh, mutation um, that's found in a, about six kids who have are intellectually disabled and have seizures, and we've made a mouse that models this, this, these kids, and it's not published yet. Um, and um, so we can use this mouse to um, to try to uh, develop a therapy. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's a degree of uh, one a mutation. It's a gain of function mutation we found. And so what approach we're taking is actually to um, lower the expression of that variant. So if you can lower the expression of the variant, um, it's um, we think it, it will. It, what it does is the variant is trashing the good good copy. So it, they bind each other, and the variant is then unstable and then trashes the good copy. So if we can get rid of the, the variant, um, then maybe you, know, you can rescue some of the uh, good variants. So we're, but we're also interested in schizophrenia. So um, so GRIA3 is one of the top hits for uh, schizophrenia, genetic hits. And so we're trying to, um, we're studying how variants in GRIA3 that are associated with schizophrenia, um, you know, behave differently than, say, a variant in GRIA3 that's involved in uh, intellectual disability or in epilepsy. So uh, we're getting more and more involved in, in um, those receptors mutations as well. And then this is the crew. Um, so this is uh, our first gathering after COVID. And, um, and a lot of it, I mean, it's bigger than uh, in my lab because of, you know, the children here, their dogs, and, uh, and um, but it was a great day that I finally get back together without masks. And this is my backyard in Baltimore, so don't believe what you think about Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd be happy to take questions or um, either about SYNGAP or about uh, other other um, other things. So does the functional analysis like mm -hmm. data points and muscle points how does that affect LTP and LTD? And are there two are those two different things or is there some association between them? So it, it's very interesting. The type of LTP and LTD I'm talking about both require NMDA receptors. And if you, um, so if you activate NMDA receptors, um, uh, highly activate them, you get LTP. If you um, lowly activate them, uh, you get LTP. So if you, for example, if you have a drug that's uh, potentiating NMDA receptors, you know, that enhances NMDA receptor function, you might uh, more easily promote LTP and vice versa if you have uh, uh, um, you know, drugs that would inhibit NMDA receptor function, we might uh, produce or uh, um, uh, inhibit LTP and maybe even induce LTP. So it's, it's a balance of, of the activation of, of NMDA receptors. Now, and we know a lot about the signaling pathways and, and what, why um, you get one or the other. Um, but it's not that it's complicated, right? Because if you activate them too much, then you start getting seizures. And um, so um, it's a very delicate balance. And that's one reason developing these drugs are very, very tricky. Because you've got to develop a drug um, that you know, um, doesn't overactivate too much. Also, you may want to have it only affect certain types of NMDA receptors that are in certain parts of the brain, not in other parts. Uh, so, you know, so group 2A, group 2B, um, you might want to activate receptors that have group 2A, but not group 2B, et cetera. So it's, it's not true. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, yeah, I've noticed that you guys are, are focused more at first on the lowering of the expression, mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering about is that because it's it's something easier that we like kind of already knew a little bit about and then the because um, i think my son would bring to it would be we'd be more on the increasing of the expression so i'm wondering which one is like more difficult or kind of so they're both they're, they're 
the novel techniques are doing both. So, so the antisense oligo has traditionally been used to lower the expression of the genes. Um, and so those are more straightforward you know, approaches. Um, but then the, the, the new techniques, we know um, how to, so for example, um, to regulate, increase the expression of the gene. And, and, and that's targeting different areas of the gene. It's, it's a little complicated. But, um, so uh, uh, you, can, you can do both. But you're right. Trying to increase the gene level is a little more, it's more subtle, and, and it's um, more uh, difficult to identify the regions of the gene that are important in regulation. And if you try to increase it too much, does that also? It's, it's not good. You know, all yeah. these genes have, are Goldilocks, right? They have yeah. here and right yeah. and exactly the right. Because then we can see more seizures at that point, yeah. right? So, so that's what I'm trying to like kind of think back to. Yeah. Um, and then how how does that work? Like that's the other thing I'm like is, is like how how exactly like even in mice? I mean, are you injecting like chemicals? So what what you do and um, so for the antisense all of those which are small small little um, nucleotides, um, we actually inject them into the brain. Okay. So um, and that's what they did with the kids with the spinal muscular muscular atrophy. They actually injected it into the spinal cord. And they would raise the, the protein SMN, which um, actually the kids saved the kids' lives. Actually. And um, so, and that problem you have to you do injections every you know, three to four months. And um, but what's happened since then is they they develop a drug that actually does the same thing as this ASO that that is orally available. No. So the, the science is really increasing rapidly. Okay. There's also developed an A B method that is basically a one one and done. They you know, inject it, and it's the injection you know, lasts a long time. So um, so there are, that's how fast the science is moving. Yeah. You start with the ASOs because that's the most direct uh, approach um, to get a rapid response. You know, develop them rapidly. And the FDA um, is, has easier on approval of ASOs than other treatments. So, um, so people are starting there and then trying to build work into drugs that you don't have to inject all the time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the, the small molecules. Um, so you know there are there, there are ways to, to to tweak, you know, tweak it a little bit or not. You know, some drugs are very potentiating. Some are just you know, tweak it a little bit, and so there's a lot of um, interest in developing those. Those, you know, sort of a um, you know menu of different types of drugs that can be used. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you mentioned uh, the Glio one mouse and. Um, so there we're going to use an antisense oligo to target the mutant gene. And that, that, that would uh, basically, so we know from genetics of GRIA1 that if you have, if you uh, eliminate both copies, it's not good. If you eliminate one, the mice are pretty normal. So the idea is if you, um, if you just get rid of that bad copy, um, which is trashing the good allele, then you, the mouth, the human would be um, would be like a heterozygote. They would have 50% of group three and one, but it would be all the normal wild type um, genome. And um, so we're using these classic uh, antisense oligo approaches to knock out. Um, so what we're doing is we're actually designing the antisense oligo against the mutation. So it will only affect the mutation with the gene and not the, the wild type. Okay. Yeah, I think um, I think GRIN one is, is actually very similar where people that have the haplosynthesis so only one protein they may have minimal or no symptoms. Um, yeah. So that would be an interesting question for one of those. Yeah. So it's very important. Um, 
you know, what the variant is, what the scanning function was, the function um, or um, negative. I mean, so we're kind of trash instead of, you know, it, it's so bad it's actually trashing the good copies too. Right. Are you finding of any, um, uh, uh, with introducing the, the methods, um, like you're talking about the virus, um, and are you finding any, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> um, I had it and I'm under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel pressure. <laughs> um, poor outcomes or like um, any, uh, oh my gosh, I can't find my words. Like a virus system. system. Adverse effects, yes, uh, of, of trying that. Um, so we, that's Thank what we you. we're all interested in doing. Right? So we are doing, um, trying to overcompress and, um, and try to get rescued. But first of all, you want to know if, if you go overshoot, is that going to be better? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people have found that with other genes. So MECP2, which is um, another gene that's been hit, um, you know, Glutazogby has worked on this for many years. and. There are, there are kids uh, who have, you know, capital insufficiencies, and then there are kids who have uh, two copies. So they have twice as much as they can be to, and they both have deficits. So she, uh, she knows that if you, um, if you go too high, if you go too full higher than normal, you're going to have problems. And um, it's sort of interesting because we predicted maybe if we made too much sin gap protein, and mice might be strong, uh, smarter. Mm -hmm. And there's some, you know, anecdotal evidence that might be true. But um, who does, you know, says that's what you see with the MEC, when you overexpress MECP2, the mice get smarter, but then they have all these other problems mm -hmm. that come along. Yeah. Um, that aren't really, aren't really to being smarter, but, um, but um, so you really need that sweet spot. Yeah. It's really great to meet you all. I mean, um, meeting parents and my kids has really been motiv incredibly motivating for me, and also my my lab. Um, it's a changed the way they think about science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.